Hi, I'm Parker Burnham, and this is the repealing of Prohibition. Hello, members of Congress. Today is December 5th, 1933. We've been called here to decide whether to make a new amendment to the Constitution to cancel out the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition of Alcohol. First off, let's review what Prohibition is and some background about it. Prohibition is banning the manufacture, sale, and transportation of all beverages with over 0.5% alcohol and was passed January 17, 1920. Before Prohibition was passed in the 1910s, the average American drank about 2.5 gallons of pure alcohol a year. This was quite a high amount of drinking, and some feared it could get even worse. There were already problems with drinking, such as men spending their entire paycheck at the saloon, then coming home broke and junk, drunk. People showing up drunk at work also opened to many possibilities for injury. Many people believed that alcohol caused people to start breaking the law. Religious leaders were some of the biggest supporters of prohibition, as many thought drinking was immoral and a sin. One priest, Reverend Billy Sunday, made this prediction before prohibition was put into action. The reign of tears is over. The slums will soon be a memory. We will turn our prisons into factories and our jails into storehouses and corn cribs. When Prohibition began, it looked promising, as all legal bars were closed and drinking was reduced by 70%. Now, despite this good start, we will hear speeches from people today who can give us more information on this long-running American debate. We will now hear from the owner of one of the illegal drinking establishments people call speakeasies. Frank Underwood, you have the floor. As you know, my name is Frank, and I owned a secret bar where people gathered for alcoholic drinks. Now, in case you didn't know, here's how speakeasies were started in the first place. For most drinkers, prohibition was a blow and caused them to lose their freedom of drinking. But when businessmen like me saw an opportunity for fortune, secret underground drinking establishments called speakeasies started to form. And when the owners of these secret bars quickly made fortunes from selling drinks to customers, they started popping up everywhere. Recently, there were said to be thousands of speakeasies in New York City alone. Most were hidden and said to be warehouses, garages, and other innocent and legal buildings. Usually, most beers and wines are only 5-12% to 12 pure alcohol. But because alcohol was made illegal, there were no laws enforcing the legal amount of alcohol in drinks which made speakeasy alcohol very intoxicating. But when the quality of these drinks goes up, so does the price. Although some speakeasies were found by law enforcers, most were met with bribes, allowing the government to become more corrupt than ever. There were quite the variety of people who came in to drink, including women. Of course, all of this profit was only made possible by some people who gave us the alcohol. The mobsters and gangsters who provided the booze called themselves bootleggers. Well, the name's Leo Middleton. I'm part of the Chicago Department of Law Enforcement, and I can tell you firsthand about the men called bootleggers behind most of the illegal alcohol production and selling done during Prohibition. These men were the fathers of organized crime. And they were a real problem for the PD because they were able to outsmart us. They were sure to cover all their tracks so we wouldn't be able to pin a crime on them. Some of these men include Al Scarface Capone, George Bugs Morin, and more. Bootleggers sold alcohol for high prices, letting them get rich faster than mobsters could ever before. And with these high amounts of cash, they could bribe the authorities if they were ever caught doing their illegal work. Although, with such high stakes and large amounts of money on the line, violence could stay dormant for long. In certain cities like Chicago, turf wars for gang territory and customers began. Someone described the streets of Chicago like a battlefield, and although most of this violence was gangster on gangster turf wars, people were getting tired of it. Then came a crime that crossed the line, even by Chicago standards. On Valentine's Day, 1929, seven men in a bootlegging gang gathered in a garage they were lined up by police officers and all shot dead. The officers were imposters set to eliminate the men in the garage by who most believe a powerful bootlegging crime lord named Al Capone. 
I cannot tell you, Congressman, enough how prohibition has really made these mobsters come to life and made our cities much more dangerous than before. Please take into account my words and don't let violence keep persisting in this country. Well, good evening, Congressman. I'm a New York citizen and I volunteered to talk here. I hope you weren't looking for fans of prohibition, prohibition because I'm definitely not a big one. Everyone's talking about going to speakeasies and want me to come, but in my opinion, they are very overpriced and somewhat hard to get to. I also don't like the bootleggers' violent ways with each other. Although, I have found other ways to get some good alcohol without speakeasies or bootleggers. For example, some hair tonics and other products have some alcohol in them. And sacramental wine was also still able to be produced and used in churches. This helped many wine manufacturers stay in business. The demand for sacramental wine went up by 800,000 gallons in California just in 1922 when sacramental wine was made legal. Ob obviously, that doesn't happen just by people joining the church. People like me seem to be attending these meetings just for sacrament time. Although most religious leaders and priests were loyal to the law of prohibition, wealth got the better of some of them and became bootleggers themselves, or had their wine stolen. One priest was even killed for his wine. Medical whiskey was still able to be sold with licenses due to its medical and pain-relieving properties. Doctors were able to earn handsome amounts of money writing whiskey prescriptions, and many people faked needing a prescription to get their hands on some precious booze. So, Congressman, people are drinking anyways, so can you please repeal prohibition and let me drink legally again? All right, the time has come for us to make our decision. But let's look at the facts we've been given. There are plenty of downsides to prohibition. At first, we thought that prohibition would stop people from becoming intoxicated and spending all their money on drinks. But speakeasy owners like Mr. Underwood have made drinks more expensive and intoxicating, making our problems worse. Prohibition was supposed to reduce crime and make our city safer, but bootleggers, as Officer Leo Middleton described, have increased the crime rate and made our cities much more dangerous than before. Prohibition has also transformed churches from places of sanity to alcohol-providing establishments, and the same goes with Dr. Whiskey. Now, with all of this in mind, all, of, all in favor of passing the 21st Amendment, repealing prohibition, say aye. Those opposed say nay. All right, all but eight states have ratified this amendment. Thank you, members of Congress. This meeting is adjourned. On December 5, 1933, the 21st Amendment repealed Prohibition and made drinking legal again. When Prohibition was finally repealed, many people celebrated, but most remained reasonable under the wishes of their president. President Roosevelt said, I trust in the good sense of the American people. Arrests for drunkenness were no different than from a normal night during Prohibition. This is because in many states, the 21st Amendment's ratification wasn't put into effect until later. Mississippi waited until 1966 to repeal their prohibition laws. Another reason may be that it wasn't very difficult to drink during prohibition, so the opening of legal bars wasn't much of a change to speakeasy drinkers. Some people even said that it was harder to get a drink after prohibition was repealed because in order to keep drinking under control, the legalization of alcohol included new bar closing hours, legal drinking ages, and more. Section 2 of the 21st Amendment allowed states to create their own drinking laws, letting states choose whether to repeal or keep prohibition for themselves. And today's drinking requirements and rules are different all around the country. The government was careful to bring back legal drinking, and because of official laws and diplomacy, for the most part, drinking is under control. Without the making and repealing of prohibition, who knows how long it would take for these laws to come along. Maybe we'd still have the laws from 1910 if Prohibition was to happen. All in all, sometimes failures like Prohibition can open the doors to many successes. It just takes a little out-of-the-box thinking.